Welcome, Regen Ag Nation. This is Rand Pod 5. I'm your host, Roger McKinley, and today I have an awesome guest speaker. Asan Sultan is joining us today, and we are going to be jumping into Soil Tech Wireless and what they bring to the market. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're, we're stoked to have you here today. So why don't you give us a quick recap of you know the last five to ten years and where you guys are at today with your technology. First and foremost, thank you for having me. We're very excited to be partnering with Regen Ag in 2024 to bring our technology and your blend of uh, services together. Uh, so thank you for that opportunity. So Soil Tech develops hardware and software to help farmers in their day-to-day operations. So we have a wireless sensor that has a number of different functions and capabilities, which I'm sure we'll run through throughout the, the podcast today, and also a software platform where the data is visualized. You're able to make decisions and also record all of your farming activity. So that's kind of where we're at today. And I'd like to give you a real brief overview as to how we got here. I wasn't fortunate enough to grow up in agriculture. I've been now exposed to it for close to a decade. I'm really fortunate to be in this industry. I spent about 10 years working in Asia, building hardware for other companies. And my, my way into the industry was, was through my mother-in-law, actually. She's, uh, she works over at a potato packing plant in southern Idaho. And kind of through her, I got to meet a lot of farmers, agronomists, advisors, retailers, consultants. And I learned a lot about the industry. I learned about what drives farmers, what they need to do on a daily basis. Uh, I also learned about some of the shortcomings of existing technology back then. And I felt like I was really well positioned to, to help, to build a product to help them. Uh, what I didn't have was credibility in agriculture. And I think that's probably the most important thing uh, when it comes to selling technology and, and really letting people know you're there to help. So I ended up being lucky enough to partner with three farmers from day one. So even before we launched to market, we worked with three farmers who told us how technology needed to look and feel and cost in order for them to really gain value from it in their operation. So I, I moved from Taiwan to uh, Burley, Idaho. That's where we started developing the product working with the local growers there, originally potato and sugar beet growers. We've now expanded to support a lot of crops, but that's kind of our roots, unsurprising given that it is in Idaho. So we spent 2018 and 2019 just dialing in the product, getting feedback, figuring out what worked, what didn't work, and then we launched a market in 2020. Right, you guys have a phenomenal product, and for those of you that haven't seen this, their device is probably about the size a little bit smaller than a football, and you guys bury that in the soil, but it's cradle to grave from that aspect of the technology to where it can get buried preseason, where you're watching weather events, water events, temperature, and then all the way through harvest. To give a real brief introduction to the, the device, it is, as Roger describes, kind of like a little football. Some people call it a minion. Some people call it an electronic potato. Uh, we welcome other nicknames, so please send those in to Roger. But it's a little yellow device that measures soil moisture, temperature, humidity, and crop damage. And it can be buried under the soil. It can measure temperature and humid, uh, moisture, so helping growers to determine when to plant, harvest, early signs of disease, as well as giving guidance on if, when, how to irrigate. And it lives under the ground throughout the whole year, uh, providing that data on a daily basis, actually on an hourly basis. Uh, then it can be harvested mechanically. That's one of the unique aspects of our product. For crops like potatoes and beets that are mechanically harvested, we get harvested alongside with it, and we're measuring the bumps and bruises that can cause crop damage, crop disease, and crop loss. Um, then we go on the, in the truck. We're following the harvested crop from field to plant or storage facility, and then we go into the storage facility, too, to monitor the temperature, humidity, and now CO2 in those environments to ensure the good work that was done in the field is not kind of lost post-harvest because, as you may know, crops don't always get straight to the table after being harvested. They can be in storage for up to a year. So the post-harvest piece is critical, and what you do in the field directly impacts what happens in storage. 
So we're able to provide insight from cradle to grave, as you call it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another amazing thing we heard uh, from a testimony of the show is these sensors not only get harvested, but they can be in multiple places inside storage. So whether that's onion, more specifically potato, you know, you have sensors along the outsides of these buildings, but not everybody's got a brand new 2024, 2023 building with millions of dollars in it. Tell our viewers how impactful this is to be able to have these sensors in the middle of the pile, the bottom of the pile, the end of the pile where, you know, from the eye, we can't see that. So these, these storage facilities are massive. And there's great technology out there uh, integrated into buildings, but it's not feasible to integrate all the sensors throughout all the piles when you're building uh, potato storage, as an example. So we've worked really hard to develop our product in a way that it can be deployed within the pile at multiple points throughout that storage facility where you wouldn't previously have had access to information. And so now... We're letting you know what the temperature, humidity, and CO2 is in the middle of the pile at multiple spots throughout a storage facility to give you early indications of problems emerging. So, yeah, w there was a case with a uh, processor that was able to get an earlier indication about disease emerging. Uh, and if you don't catch it quick, it spreads. So they were able to take remedial action isolate the problem, and not have it affect that whole storage facility. In that regard, we were able to save a significant amount of crop loss. That's huge in the versatility of the product and, and the data. It comes back to the data and the management. It's not only on the farmer side, but also the processor side. And we know that there's loss in all of that. So if we can mitigate that loss in utilizing this data and seeing not only are we looking at field data, we're looking at storage data at the end of the day. That's a win on both sides for farmers and processors to ultimately make everybody more money at the end of the day. It's making people more money, and then more broadly, it's um, more environmentally friendly. We're wasting less crop. Um, I think that's important, right, from a high-level perspective. And it all stems from helping the farmer first. That's our priority as a company. We help the farmer first uh, in all the ways in which we've discussed today. But in doing so, we can help the environment more broadly, uh, reduced water, reduce crop loss, reduce emissions. Uh, but it all starts with helping the farmer. Well, definitely. And, and what you're touching on there is all the different metrics of the dollars involved inside that crop as well. So without having that data, which we feel like is a critical piece moving forward in 24 in utilizing these technologies, is having that data can then we can backtrack that and say monetarily, where are we at in the season? What have we done? And how do we pair that with the data? Absolutely. It's critical that technology is delivering value. I think there's a tendency for some technology just to provide data for the sake of data. And data is great, don't get me wrong, but there's got to be a tangible benefit to the farmer, the guy that's got it in the ground and utilizing it. It's got to help him save money, increase yield, uh, decrease inputs, and better organize manpower. And all of those things can be helped with technology. Now, technology is not like a, a magic black box that's going to do it all for you. We never position it as such because we think that the grower is in control. They know best. So we're providing them with a tool to help them dial in where they feel they need assistance. You know, I'm talking about water. It's just such a critical thing out there. I know that you guys have the sensor below ground, but you also have an above ground sensor that can tie back into that. Tell, tell everybody why this is an awesome piece of the technology that you have as well. So this year we, we launched a, uh, a rain gauge. So it sits on top of the soil surface. Uh, it's calculating how much rain a field is receiving or verifying what's coming off of your pivot or your sprinkler package. And so, you know, first and foremost, it's great to have a field level indication of rain. I, I think the weather is one of the most important things that farmers check on a daily basis. So giving them their own private weather network is a value in and of itself. And then beyond that, you might see that you got an inch or two of rain, which is typically a lot of water to get. But then our sensor can validate if that water actually hit the root. 
And the same goes for your, your sprinkler package, your pivot package. You might have set your pivot to, to run it an inch, put an inch down. Um, but there could be high wind. There could be high temperature. You know, you, you've got high levels of evapotranspiration, which ultimately meant the water that you think you got didn't have the impact on the crop. Our sensor can pick up whether or not moisture hit at your 12-inch your or your 24-inch level. So I, I think, you know, going back to putting the right amount on, uh, it, it's really important because you could rely on the rainfall. You could think we got enough, but maybe you didn't. And then the dollars come back in on the backside of that. I think it's four years is what Simplot originally put out there for farmers rebuilding. I mean, you're talking spray nozzles, hoses, motors, the, the flow. And they only calibrate that every couple of years to where you know exactly what that is. I mean, you're talking 15 grand to get in there and rebuild that. That is massive savings on the farmer side of going, no, this thing's still putting out an inch of water just like we calibrated or we are way off on this pivot. And adding to that, sometimes it's really difficult to catch up with your water because your pivot can only go around so fast. It can only put down so much per revolution. And so if you've skipped one or you're planning to skip one based on a rainfall, but in truth, the water didn't hit the root, we can provide you with an opportunity to actually say, no, let's run it. Let's keep going despite the rain. We don't want to fall behind. Because playing catch-up, I think, is extremely difficult. Now, you're talking stress, loss, uh, critical growing points of the season for the plants. When we start talking technology and farmers, and one of the things we run into in regenerative agriculture is the adaptation of something new. And that is a massive challenge in whether that's a new process of what they're putting down, looking at high salt load fertilizers versus something that is more organic that's going to work with the biology that's in the soil. What is one of the biggest constraints or roadblocks in getting the adaptation of ag tech on, on your side and utilizing these platforms with farmers? There's always a challenge when you're selling anything. And I think the, the challenge is heightened in agriculture where there's so much on the line. There's money in the ground and there's ultimately food that's going to be harvested. So every decision the farmer makes is so critical. And I think the most important thing is developing trust, encouraging and letting the customer know that you've done it before, you've worked with their neighbors, you've demonstrated success. That is what will kind of break down the barriers to adoption because there's been a lot of technology that's been promoted over the years and a lot of it's failed. So technology or, or any other new additives to a farming operation has an uphill battle. And rightly so. You've just got to be able to prove it. And I think the best way to prove it is not by the company telling the, the grower that it works, but by asking another farmer to give you a testimonial. So we've really taken pride in, in cultivating great testimonials. And we've been able to do that by really consciously handholding the customer from day one and not trying to have too many customers, right? Because if you have too many customers, you can't service them. And we've also, as a company, fallen foul of that because we're small. So we've really had to relook in some cases about whether we can really support something. And we would, in some cases, maybe have to turn down business so that we can really maintain and support the current business that we have. And that comes back into the trust aspect of what you're talking about, creating a quality product, good service that isn't too hard for the customer to understand and utilize and get benefit out of that. So as we get into the aspect of water, this kind of ties back into management. And we talked about the previous podcast, you know, good managers create a good crop at the end of the day. So in managing water, tell our, tell our viewers out there why this is so critical moving forward in agriculture and why is this a hot button in the world right now in general? So specific to us, uh, when we were developing the product, you know, we would ask growers, what's a fundamental um, pain point or, or uh, a concern for you? And it, it always was water because the crops need water <laughs> to survive, to grow, to thrive. And so we wanted to build a technology that could help them in that effort. And, you know, it's not always about more or less. It's about what the crop needs. And I think that's what maybe people f much further downstream 
misunderstand, right? There's always this this push to 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 cut back, to save, to reduce, but that's not what is always necessary. Sometimes that crop needs water. So I, I, I hope that we're providing a technology that can help managers get a good insight into the soil and really determine what's needed for that crop and then have the data to back it up. Uh, they're not just making a, a decision based on throwing a finger in the air. It's based on their knowledge of the soil, them being out there in the field, them holding that soil, feeling it, determining what's needed, and then leveraging the data as well to make that collective decision. Well, I think that data aspect is absolutely critical compared to you know, other technologies that are in the field where I feel like you guys, your technology really shines because utilizing that data at the end of the day gives us a completely different look at how and what we're doing and more the why in, in agriculture. So that, why don't you jump in a little bit on the data side that, that makes you guys different? I mean, we've seen this, we're utilizing this, but for our viewers out there listening, give them a, a look into the data aspect of what you guys do on the back end. So not only does the sensor monitor, tracks all this stuff, but how do we utilize that data on the back end of the service? Sure. It really comes down to simplicity. Uh, I think because growing a crop takes so much more than most people think, so many more activities and steps. And so technology has to just deliver simple insight. It has to be quick, actionable, and let growers move on with their day. So no matter what we do, it has to be delivered seamlessly and simply. Um, and that's helping you make decisions in the moment, in the season. But then what's great about technology like ours is that post-season you have a record. You have all that information from the fields. And you have the output. You have the crop. You can see the yield and the quality. And then you can try to figure out what you did right, what you did wrong. So I think data provides a dual benefit. One, it's in-the-moment decision-making that's going to lead to uh, the, the good or bad outcomes of the crop. But then it's looking back. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? How can you improve? Because there's always going to be a next season and an opportunity to either correct mistakes or just double down on what you did right. And I, I guess that's where the ROI really steps in in this, this footprint of farmers utilizing this kind of technology of saying, hey, we ran this water event at this time. We knew we needed x in the field we were short at this time period oh we need to replicate that again in the next season and that just comes back into the management we can write recommendations all day long in the field our agronomists can have the best tools at hand but if we don't get the water right we don't have a quality crop at the end of the season yeah and, and the benefits compound right because uh you maybe you get started with technology in year one you're in one corner of one field and you see an improvement and then you're able to double down and the benefits compound across your operation as you get comfortable with technology, as you get comfortable with understanding what the data can do for you. So in utilizing this data, how important is it to make decisions? What, it, what have you guys seen on your side from pulling this data in? How does that help the farmers make a quality decision in moving forward? Even before making a decision, a new decision, the beauty with technology is that it can help validate what you're already doing right. I think that's a really important point because I think for the most part, growers are dialed in. There's no doubt about it. And what technology can do is give them an edge, give them uh, a corner case that might not have been evident had they not had that technology sitting in their field year round because growers are going to their fields every day on rotation. But you can't necessarily be everywhere at once. So technology is really helping them dial in and validate. I think that's, that's a really important thing that's overlooked with technology. And, and maybe start to give you earlier indications, right? So we've had examples of our sensor technology showing potential problem earlier than they would have uh, had with their typical kind of scouting operations, right? Really what you're getting at is disease modeling, being able to take in all the different aspects of soil, temperature, climate, potentials at that time of the year based on heat days in the soil. So 
that's how data can take it a step further, right? It's the simple metrics. It's how wet is your, your soil? What is the temperature? But then what does that mean more broadly about your risk of diseases? We, we take a combination of temperature and humidity data to suggest that the environmental uh, conditions are such that you're at risk of Cercospora. So this is how I think data can take things a step further. And we're not trying to reinvent the wheel with regards to disease modeling. There's so many great academic sources out there, so many proven models. So we are leveraging that information, those algorithms, those data points, marrying it with our sensor information to give our customers early insight. Uh, and that manifests not just in the field, but also in storage, uh, where you might previously not have had an eye, so to speak. Uh, you wouldn't know the temperature necessarily deep within your pile of potatoes, but you can put a soil tech beacon under there and start to see, is temperature spiking? Is CO2 spiking? Are we seeing early signs of rot, of disease, of bloating? And so these are some of the, the edges that data can provide. That's that concept of... Is this saving our farmers more money or is it making them more money? And I can see that the value there is exponential, especially in that kind of situation. Yeah. We've had cases where we save the money, whether on uh, water, trips to the field, man hours, but also gain them more money by increasing their yield quality, um, reducing crop loss, or having a uh, less bruised crop as, a, as one real good example for here in Idaho. So uh, potato growers that contract with processors are often uh, stipulated to provide a certain amount of crop that's bruise-free. And if they can provide more percentage bruise-free, they get more money per sack of potatoes. So that's directly putting hopefully more revenue into growers' pockets. Definitely. Yeah, you know, This also comes back to how farmers are stewards of the land and how would you say this device helps prove or show or demonstrate to everyone out there that by utilizing something like this we can be good stewards to your point i think most growers are naturally good stewards of the land they they want to do good in their soils they they know that that is what's driving their livelihood so i think they proactively take good care of it no matter whether they're stipulated to or not and i think that if a grower is adopting technology, it's showing that they try to go a step further. They might have a really great water management plan in place, but they just want to get it 5% better. And they're, they're investing in technology. They're investing in time to get an even deeper understanding to see where they can get that edge from. So even just in adopting technology, that's growers demonstrating how they want to take the next steps how they're being more sustainable, how they are truly good stewards of the land. That gives us the ability to track everything at the end of the day to say, here, this is the practices we did do on these farms. These are the inputs that we utilize. This is our metrics to prove what we're doing. So instead of agencies or governments saying, hey, you guys are the ones that are the problem, we can turn around and say, no, we are awesome stewards. We did utilize this. This is what this crop needed at the end of the day. I think one of the other things that we see is as all this technology keeps on coming out, how do you see this landscape changing? Now, you've been in this almost 15 years. How is it going to get better? Well, one trend I'm seeing is, is more willingness to try technology, which is a good thing, right? I, I think we went through a period of technology failing, and so now hopefully more growers are willing to give it another shot. And that's encouraging. And I think it's also a necessity because a lot of farms are consolidating. You're dealing with a lot more land in some cases with limited resources. So it, it, it's going to be a, a necessary tool in some cases. Um, so it's encouraging to see more willingness to try technology. I also think that unfortunately there's going to be more burden uh, top-down burden to report, to provide data, uh, whether it's from processors, CPGs, agencies. And in a lot of respects, it's needed, right? But in most regards, it's, it's a pain because it's adding time and work for the grower. So we're hoping that we can demonstrate the technology can reduce that burden. So if you are having to provide reports at the end of the year, having technology like ours can 
make that a more simplified process. Definitely. And and we know that what you're saying is 100 percent spot on. We're seeing this from agriculture initiatives. We're seeing this from processors pushing it down. But one of the biggest advantages that we see by utilizing this is bringing more value back to the customers. If the customer has the ability, and when I say customers, those are our farmers. Those are our row crop growers, corn, sugar beets, hops, potatoes, onions. If we can provide a tool at the end of the day that can track all this and say, hey, we are being better stewards. We are being more sustainable. We have produced a better quality crop, and we can prove and demonstrate that at the end of the year in a succinct way. And then guess what? We can create more demand for those crops grown in that format. And having the, the track and trace aspect of this data not only sets them up for the next year, but it gives them a platform to push forward in this new regenerative space and saying, hey, we do have the best product out there. We are being great stewards, and here are our numbers. Yeah, actually, on those lines, Soil Tech has a, a long-term goal to help farmers get paid more. We all know there's a big push around sustainability uh, from the consumer themselves. They want to know where crops came from, that they would grow more sustainably. And to do all of those things, it costs the grower more money. And so we are hoping that over time and in collecting information, collecting data to prove that they are good stewards of the land, that they're adopting good practices, that they can get rewarded. The growers can get paid more for their crop. And I don't know whether that's an overly ambitious goal because there's so many moving parts of that puzzle. But if, if we can play a part in that, in getting growers paid more for, mon- uh, more for their crops by demonstrating that they're doing all the right things, I think that's going to be a big win for us and for the industry in general. I want to jump back into one other thing that we just heard at the show, and it's about how you're harvesting these devices in the field and what it's showing from a modeling standpoint. So originally you guys were, these were getting dug up in the field. They are put on the ground with potatoes. They were getting harvested once and going into storage. We now know that What you're wanting farmers to do is as soon as that is dumped, you want to grab that device again, go put it out in the field, and dig it a second time. What is that showing from a modeling standpoint in the past versus now? Yeah, it's absolutely important to run multiple tests in the field to look for uh, consistent patterns uh, before making a decision about if you're doing something right or wrong. So with regards to the harvest capabilities of our device and pinpointing areas where you could be bruising your crop, it, it's imperative to do it multiple times. And then as you're doing that, you're also getting to understand who's utilizing the device, how the harvest crew is responding, if and when there's areas for improvement. That, and that's critical. That's critical in all of that because that is the most, at that point in time, when you're pulling that out of the field, that's your money. So if you're if those harvesters are moving too fast, if they're too high, you know, we start running into major fatigue. I mean, we're humans at the end of the day. You're working 10, 14, 15 days, 12, 14 hour days. We know that we're going to hit thresholds. So that is massive for dollars at the end of the day, making sure that we're not damaging that crop before we get it into the most important time of storage. You know, when it's harvest time, it's go time, and you're at the, the whims of Mother Nature more often than not, and that necessitates sometimes digging all day long, digging in mid, at midnight and into 2 a.m. And so, yeah, I, I think it's a great opportunity to understand if – those activities are having an adverse effect on the, the crop quality. And we, we do see processors diving in in a little bit more detail as to the specifics. So after you harvest and you start hauling the, the crop towards the processing plant, how long was it on the road? How long did it stay on the truck outside the plant before it had its slot to be processed? Did that impact the starches, the sugars, I think all of these things are starting to provide insight that was never really seen before and that can be correlated by the data. To your point about how it's evolved over the years, it was, you know, at its, uh, at it, at its infancy, it was just to show where you're bruising. But now it's how do we optimize those truck routes? What is the true impact? What's the threshold on how long we can leave crop inside a truck before we harvest it, uh, process that crop? Uh, 
uh, do we need to rethink the way in which we're managing our resources uh, and the way in which we organize the, the workflow? We're looking for that 5%. Those farmers can pick up that extra 5% because sometimes that's that's profit at the end of the day to where if you're leaving that on the table with thin margins, prices for everything going up, I mean, that that is critical to say, hey, if there's a way we can look at this, skin the cat a little bit different because how you do anything is how you do everything. Absolutely. And that just goes back to respecting that technology is a very small part of farming. Now, the farmer is in control. They are making all the critical decisions. They generally know best. Tech is just helping them get that little edge. And, you know, it pays itself back in dividends because, you know, for a, a field of potatoes, that's tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line. So if you can help them to reduce brews in some instances, or if you've helped them reduce a few, pa a few passes of, of, of a pivot, you've really helped to save money, save water, and hopefully put additional money into the growers' pockets. Excellent. So I guess finally in rounding this out, what are the priorities when building ag tech for, for you as a company? Listening and understanding what's really needed from technology and not uh, overdeveloping for the sake of saying that you have high tech. So it's really just, yeah, understanding what's required from the end user. And that's how we built the product from day one and it's how we continue to evolve. It's by listening, not overdeveloping, making sure you focus on the fundamentals. Well, we'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. We got more awesome technology coming your way on RandPod. I'd like to thank Asan for joining us, and we will catch you next time.